Equivocation, the bedrock of gender identity. The most popular strategy for advancing gender identity relies on using a combination of two logical fallacies. The first is equivocation. This involves mistakenly equating two different definitions of the same word. You wanted to answer questions about women's studies, and so the first answer you should be able to provide is what exactly is a woman? Well, it's, it, for me, it's, it's actually a really simple answer, and that's a person who identifies as a woman. But what are they identifying as? Uh, as a woman. But, but what is that? As a woman. Dr. Patrick Kutsanka of the University of Tennessee is mistakenly trying to use two different definitions of the word woman, even if he doesn't realize it. The first definition is circular and therefore incoherent. But then when Matt asks, well, what is that? And he says, as a woman, it's clear that the reason he thinks that what he is saying is self-evident is because he has subconsciously reverted back to the original definition, adult human female, without acknowledging or perhaps even being aware of it. As a woman. Do you know what a circular definition is? I do. It's sort of like what you're doing right now, where a woman is, is a woman. Mm -hmm. Because well, you're seeking what we would call in my field of work an essentialist definition of gender. I think it sounds like you would like me to give you a set of biological or cultural characteristics that are associated with one gender or the other. I'm not seeking any type of definition. I'm just seeking a definition. Yeah, and I gave you one. The second is an appeal to consequence, which is an argument that concludes a hypothesis, typically a belief, to be either true or false based on whether the premises lead to desirable outcomes. It's not specifically a religious view that biological sex cannot be altered. It's not. There are many, many people, mm. lesbians in fact, and homosexual men, and people from across the political spectrum, people in every single party here, that do not, that would agree with the statement that trans women are by definition male. They wouldn't be making it on the basis of hate. So what I'm interested in finding out is whether you're going to try and make statements like that, that you class them as inherently harmful, whereas no, in, no offence was intended. It's just a difference of belief. It's a belief that we don't subscribe to. A difference of belief yes. that in that, in that sort of Last instance, question, if Senator that Rice. is in a workplace or if it is a statement that's been given to a, a young person who is attempting to affirm their gender, leads to severe mental unwellness, severe the impact on them of not I'm being able to affirm their agenda, it leads to suicide ideation, leads to potential suicide. I that is the reality for trans and gender diverse people. Before I get into specific examples, I think it's important to look at how these two logical fallacies are used in combination to maximise their rhetorical impact. Also, to be clear, I should say that what is typically known as gender identity ideology, I will be referring to as gender theology or gender theism. This is because, as I will show, at its core, the belief in medicalized gender identities involves metaphysical beliefs. And it's my assertion that directly addressing the religious features of this doctrine is fundamental to properly understanding it and refuting it. The belief that you are literally not the sex that you actually physically are because mentally you feel like you were born into the wrong body requires a belief in a disembodied essence that can be born into the wrong body. And that is a religious belief that I do not share and have no interest in pursuing. The demand that I recognize and treat someone as if they are something they are not is demanding that I participate in their religious belief. So the basic strategy of gender theologians or gender theists is to use a series of linguistic shell games, which are enabled via equivocation, that ultimately end with the gender theologian saying some variation of, it doesn't matter that my argument is incoherent, because if gender identity ideology doesn't win, then people will die. Leads to potential suicide. Unfortunately, this is also a logical fallacy, but it's one that has more emotional appeal than the pedantic word games that they normally open with. As a woman... On the other hand, a straight appeal to consequence would be far less likely to be effective. Instead, by starting with the word games, they're able to psychologically pull their opponents off balance, either by getting them to fall for one of their attempts at equivocation, or, at the very least, raising doubts in their mind about one of these attempts. 
And so once their opposition has been weakened by this process, using an appeal to consequence is far more likely to succeed. An appeal to consequence is often not that different to the arguments made by terrorists, in that their message to their target is, we're telling you to do this particular thing, not necessarily because it's the right thing to do, or at least that's not why you will be doing it. Instead, you will be doing it out of fear of what will happen if you don't. It's extortion. Given this, perhaps it's not surprising that there are key aspects of the way that gender identity ideology presents a distorted view of trans suicide, which works in a very similar way to the anti-terrorism hysteria that gripped America after 9-11. I understand that for many people, the idea that trans suicide is being misrepresented for political gain will be difficult to accept. Nonetheless, this is probably not too dissimilar from how many people in 2001 also found it difficult to process that a similar thing was happening with terrorism. This essay is not focused on going into the data and with regard to this specific discussion, I believe it is a red herring. However, for those who are looking for an in-depth look at the data, I highly recommend checking out Jesse Singal's work. What is pertinent to this discussion is that whether or not the threat of trans suicide was or still is proportional to popular expectations, no amount of trans women killing themselves over the fact that trans women are men will make this not true. Part of the reason why these panics work so well is because they each target the angels of either the left or right wing of American capitalism. On the right, are the troops who on 9-11 were also accompanied by American civilians. Meanwhile, on the left is a new consumer demographic largely comprised of alienated youth who have an apparent spirituality or brand loyalty that centers around recruiting lifelong patients for Big Pharma. Different blocks of capital champion each group out of economic self-interest. Not surprisingly, in both cases, these people that are seen as sacred are apparently being targeted by an ever-present threat from which they can never truly be safe. And best of all, at least for the people in charge, this danger can strike at any time, even snatching people's family members from the assumed safety of American domestic life. In this sense, trans women are women is the woke version of support the troops. It's the terrified babbling of a person who has lost touch with reality and not always for completely unrelatable reasons. Another similarity is that the so-called support of the troops and the so-called support of transgender people involves feeding either group into various mechanisms of industrial slaughter, one for colonial expansion, the other for religious sacrifice. Like a monkey ready to be shot into space. Space monkey. So, perhaps not surprisingly, just as the post-9-11 behaviour of the United States significantly exacerbated the threat of terrorism, the behaviour of gender identity theologians is consistently in direct contravention of safeguarding guidelines that address responsibly talking about suicide in the media. As Bernard Lane wrote in The Australian, also troubling is the activist mantra that kids will kill themselves if the trans project encounters any obstacle, personal or political. Lillian says, I don't understand why this one mental health condition is the exception to international best practice around how we talk about suicide. Some suicide appears contagious, hence the well-known advice, don't harp on the risk for a specific group. That is the reality for trans and gender diverse people. Don't imply taking your life is a default option. It leads to suicide ideation. Don't catastrophize setbacks. Don't oversimplify the causes of suicide. It leads to potential suicide. Activists rediscover the risk of suicide contagion when they misrepresent media coverage that questions their narrative. Most gender theists probably haven't given much thought to this, but if their argument rests on the understanding that so long as trans people are killing themselves, then none of their positions have to make any sense. What am I supposed to tell the TERFs? That I'm a woman because reasons? No, not even because reasons. This puts gender theology in a position 
where it is quite easy for them to become invested in sustaining or even increasing the rate of trans suicide. This is similar to the way that the US government ironically gained more power to start wars and strip people of their civil liberties in proportion to both the number and success of the terrorist attacks that were carried out against them. And in both cases, whether anybody intended for this incentive to arise is irrelevant to whether or not it actually did. An appeal to consequence is similar to an appeal to authority in that the fact that it's being used doesn't prove an argument, but it doesn't necessarily disprove one either. For example, someone may say that an argument is correct because it's in a textbook. However, even if it is correct, being in the book is not what makes it that way. However, that doesn't necessarily mean that the argument is false either, just that it can't be proven correct by appealing to the authority of the book. Likewise, if the truth of a particular position will lead to negative consequences, that doesn't necessarily mean that those consequences aren't real or horrible, just that these things do not falsify the position against which they are being used. The reason they say trans women are women and not trans women are women because X is because it's not really an argument, it's an order. They're attempting to avoid a debate, which probably explains their slogan, no debate. If they were being transparent, they would say, we believe that people should act as if trans women are women so they don't kill themselves. That would be coherent, as well as not requiring the erasure of any words. The problem for gender identity theology is that this would force them to admit that they are, in fact, making an argument and not simply providing objective observations, which would then open them up to rebuttal. On the other hand, if they act as if they genuinely believe the nonsense statement that trans women are women, which cannot be believed precisely because it is fundamentally incoherent, then once the intellectual bar has been lowered enough for this first absurd premise to be accepted, they can then lead people through a linguistic hall of mirrors where the discussion can be dragged out for as long as necessary without the theologians having to be so crass as to appeal directly to consequence. Instead, they are now able to pretend like they're explorers with special, life-saving information and not con artists in the process of peddling sex lobotomies to minors. Ironically, this is quite similar to the way that regular churches work. Trans and God both have similar problems because the people who pretend to believe in them want them to be both unlimited in any way, but also coherent. However, if something doesn't have even a single conceptual limitation, then it leaves one with nothing to describe. It's like asking for the numerical value of a scribble. Words have definitions, and if there's nothing to define, then it can't be spoken about. It's telling that all of the problems that gender theologians face by trying to prove the nonsense statement that trans women are women could disappear and they could theoretically achieve the same social outcomes simply by instead saying people should act as if trans women are women. After all, behind all the trickery and threats, this is what they really mean to say. This would give the game away. It's not, it's not enough for people to comply with gender identity for their own reasons. It requires complete ideological saturation. It doesn't matter if 99% of people think the emperor's clothes look great. If there's even one kid in front of everyone on live TV saying, hey, look at his balls, then it ruins the whole thing. A doctrine as bankrupt as gender identity ideology can allow for no separation between church and state. They can't say that people should merely act as if trans women are women, for the same reason Big Brother didn't say people should merely act as if 2 plus 2 equals 5. In order for it to work, you have to not only believe it, you have to love it. You have to be unable to see any other way. Like 2 plus 2 equals 5, trans women are women is less about articulating an idea and more about making non-compliance with the dominant ideology literally unthinkable by destroying the concepts that would be necessary to refute it. It's insane and it is like the thing where if you accept that trans women are women 
you can't make any of the arguments that we make. And that's why they push that so hard, no, like that no catechism. One, no, no one believes it. Mm -hmm. Even if there's people sitting here watching it that say, I believe trans women are women. You don't, mm -hmm. you don't, you don't. Yeah. You, 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 no one believes it, right? But for me, I think it's actually the act of defeat. So at the point that you repeat something that you know not to be true, mm -hmm. you are then susceptible to repeat, to just keep repeating things that yeah. follow on from the other thing that are not true, that follow on from the other thing. And where does that actually lead? Yeah, the thing about the, the, the deception, that's so interesting because it's like, it's almost like when the, the emperor's new clothes and then the second you say like, yeah, I like them, you're screwed. Like you're in it now. You have to keep praising them essentially. You're dying. Your light is growing faint. And if it goes up, that means you're dead. That is the reality for trans and gender diverse people. Your voice is so low, I can scarcely hear what you're saying. You think that you could get well again if children believed in fairies? Do you believe? Oh, please, please believe. If you believe, wherever you are, clap your hands and she'll hear you. Clap, clap, don't let me die, clap you're screwed like you're in it now you have to keep praising them you think you know everything because you got bit by a roach that crawled out of a dictionary so resisting these strategies obviously requires understanding how they work being able to recognize when they're being used and specifically being aware of what information is being concealed when it's being used okay so first Let's make sure that there's no confusion around the term equivocation. As stated previously, equivocation is a logical fallacy that involves mistakenly equating two different definitions of the same word. For example, the word star has two different meanings. One is a giant flaming ball of gas and the other is a famous person. So equivocation would be to say, for example, Tom Cruise is a star. A star is a giant flaming ball of gas, therefore Tom Cruise is a giant flaming ball of gas. Or alternatively, let's just say jazz music is cool. Cool is the opposite of warm, therefore jazz music can be used to decrease temperature. That's another form of equivocation. And this dynamic is often the basis for jokes because it involves like double or hidden meanings in the same way that a joke does. Kids can be so cruel. We can? Thanks, Mom. Ow, cut out, bike. Here, the word can is being equivocated. The first meaning that Marge intended to use was that kids have the capacity to be cruel, while the meaning that Bart wanted to hear was that kids have permission to be cruel. And it's by this same mechanism that gender identity theology essentially forces people to take a joke literally. For example, take the word seahorse. A seahorse is not really a horse but it does have a real connection to the sea. In this sense, the name is a type of joke or wordplay based on an aspect of the appearance of this particular creature. Likewise, the Tasmanian tiger was named tiger because of how it looked. Again, it wasn't really a tiger, but it really was from Tasmania. In keeping with this pattern, trans women are not really women, but they are really trans, which is to say on the other side of, which in this case is to say not. A trans woman is a type of man that is merely named woman due to aspects of their appearance, like with seahorses and Tasmanian tigers. With that being said, we can now move on to the short list of terms and phrases that need to be disambiguated. These include gender, gender identity, gender non-conforming, trans, cis, sex, intersex, hermaphrodite, sex assigned at birth, man, woman, puberty blocker, <laughs> biological essentialist, gender abolition, queer theory, and gender ideology. Some terms will be easier to disambiguate than others. He has, like, all these views about things. Yeah. I don't really know if I agree with him on most of his things. 
they Children lose their die. dicks? Yeah. 